Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Psychology Podcast. I am your host, Daniel Curry. In my podcast, I interview extraordinary people and pick their brains. Each episode will feature a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a different perspective on the many paths that can lead to a rich and fulfilled life. This includes their favorite books, morning routines, exercise habits, trade secrets, nutritional philosophies, and their overall take on happiness and success. My goal is to find out where those amazing people get their holistic results from, so that you and I can use their tactics and go kick ass in life as well. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy today's episode. So Scott, I'm very happy to have you. Um, how are you right now? Oh, I'm great. I'm great to be. It's great to be here. Perfect. Um, Scott, for people who don't know you, if they ask you what you do, what do you say to them? You know what? That's actually a hard question. Uh, these days, I usually tell people I'm a writer, which is followed up by the obvious question, well, what do you write about? <laughs> and I find it hard to answer sometimes because I do write a blog. Um, it's about broadly kind of self-improvement, psychology, personal philosophy. But really, the blog is just kind of anything that I think is interesting to write about. And so a lot of that has to do with learning these days. So I write a lot about learning. And in particular, over the last couple of years, I've taken on some learning challenges um, that, you know, I hope people have found a little bit interesting. And, and so this has been things that occupy me. But yeah, I, that's what I write about. I, I write about learning. I write about habits, personal productivity, that kind of thing. What motivated you to start your blog? Because I really had to look up even in the dictionary and that there is no precise description for what you are doing. I heard you one time say that you are an educational entrepreneur and I thought that was very interesting. Where, What motivated you to pursue this journey of yours? Well, okay, so that's that's an interesting question. So I've been writing for a long time now. I've, I've been writing for uh, a little over 13 years. Uh, on this blog, so it's it's been a while, and I think it's hard to say about one just motivation for starting. When I started blogging, it was actually just really uh, spur of the moment. I um, I'd been working on some software projects, and I wanted to improve my writing ability, and so it was sort of like, well, you know, maybe I could write a blog for a little bit, just get a little bit of practice. So that was the kind of very very kernel of starting the blog. But then I I liked the writing, and it's kind of you know, over the last 13 years, there's been lots of different changes that have happened that have taken it to where it is today. But uh, yeah, definitely wasn't just an idea of, okay, I'm going to do exactly what I'm doing now 13 years ago. It was just getting started doing stuff. And then eventually, you know, you follow a path and you get down to here. That's so interesting. One one thing that really fascinates me about you is the uh, the courage of starting and, and believing that you can learn almost everything. Do you have a memory Uh, maybe from your childhood or uh, a story of yours where you started to develop this level of self-efficacy where you just like saw things that you wanted to learn and then you deductively broke them down and made plans for yourself on how to acquire them? Well, nothing, nothing so grandiose as that, I think. Like, I did well in school when I was when I was younger and so I think confidence is just, uh, it's so important. I, I talk to a lot of people who you know, if you develop a bad relationship with learning, like if you have bad experiences either in school or trying to learn something on your own where you judge yourself as being inferior to your peers or, or you judge yourself as not doing it very well, this creates an unpleasant feeling and that unpleasant feeling can be really baked down at a fundamental level. So it's very hard to get the effort to do things because when you think about studying for something or when you think about learning X, you just get this anxiety or this this unpleasant feeling. And so I think that is honestly probably a, a harder thing to overcome than just lacking ability because yes, some people will have more ability than others and some people will be better than others at certain things. But I think the real challenge is just that if you if you struggle with it, it's a lot harder to get that enthusiasm up for putting in the effort. So I've talked a little bit about kind of ways you can get around it. But one of the things that I really like and, and where I've kind of directed my attention is taking on these learning projects, which are not in a competitive sense. They're not in a, I'm doing it with 20 other people and then we're going to be ranked at the end for who did it best. Uh, I just do things on my own. And I found that it's a lot better because then you can really you know, you really get to control the feedback. Um, you don't, you're not making those direct comparisons. So it's always just sort of challenging your personal best. It's always just challenging what you think you can do uh, versus, 
you know, what other people are doing and, and ranking yourself. Cause you know, we were talking just briefly, I'll just introduce some of the projects that I've done, but one of them was this MIT challenge where I did, um, a, an attempt to learn MIT's, uh, for your computer science curriculum over 12 months. And so I did that by taking all of their free materials online and just testing myself on the exams and doing the programming projects. And that was a project that was very much set out, not because I was comparing it to someone else, but just because, you know, I, I had kind of taken some classes and I was like, well, you know, maybe I could do something like this. And I just kind of research built up and I did it. Um, another one was doing a language learning project where I went out with a friend and we learned uh, four different languages in one year. Uh, we called it the year without English because the method of the challenge was to not speak English for an entire year. So we went to Spain to learn Spanish, Brazil to learn Portuguese, uh, China to learn Mandarin Chinese and Korea to learn Korean. So it was really like, all of these projects were kind of unique in a way. And I think, I don't know whether I would have felt the same way about them if I had been in a class of 30 people and you know, I'm working really hard and then they, I get the class grade back and like, oh, actually you're only 20 out of 30. You're not actually ranked that high. So the doing the thing on your own and having that independent self-directed learning activity for me has just been so important because it allows you to control that feedback environment so the challenge is right for you the goal is right for you and you can kind of remove those distractions of seeing how you measure up to other people so interesting what was it like to hold that uh, that ted talk oh that was good i i was uh it was kind of interesting because that one came sort of in the middle of the project so i had been doing it for about mm, maybe I'm trying to remember. I did it for about maybe four or five months, and I was contacted by uh, the organizers who put on the uh, TEDx event. So it wasn't a, a, a full TED talk, but I did a TEDx event, and they were interested in having me out there. So it's interesting for that one because I'm doing the talk, and the talk is up there now. Uh, when I haven't finished it yet, like I'm still in the middle <laughs> of doing it when they were writing about it. And of course, I did finish, and I did uh, complete it the way I set out to. So I wasn't didn't have egg on my face in that way, but it was definitely a little bit amusing that um, <laughs> that I that the, the main talk that I have about it is is from the halfway point. <laughs> Beautiful. And um, one thing that I wanted to ask you is, um, I'm also always uh, creating challenges for myself. One one of my challenge for this year is actually to find a way to sneak into Harvard. And I wanted to walk us through through the mindset of how do you come up with the ideas for your challenges and what is currently you must have like a like a bucket list of of challenges that you want to tackle but maybe you don't have the time right now but what's in your challenge bucket list for you right now sure well i have lots of ideas usually what happens is i'll get some idea and be kind of you know i think this is how a lot of people think about things but you you get some idea and you're like oh wouldn't that be cool and you start thinking about it more and more and the thing is is that often there's not like a lot of detail to the idea in the beginning it's just something strikes you um so for the mit challenge it was uh you know Well, the idea that struck me then was just recognizing that if you had all the materials and you had complete flexibility in how you went through them, meaning that you didn't have to do every assignment, you didn't have to attend every lecture, you just had to pass the final exam, what would that flexibility and freedom offer you? So that was the sort of initiating of, of that challenge. Um, the Year Without English didn't even start with that idea of doing it under that concept. It was just, well, maybe I was going to go traveling with a friend and, and maybe we would learn languages and it kind of evolved over time. And so I think these ideas don't come all at once. They sort of, you get some broad impression of the idea and then as you think about it more and more, you kind of resolve the details. And often a lot of times you resolve the details and you recognize, you know what, actually I don't want to do it. It has this problem or, or that problem. So most of the things that I've had as ideas I haven't actually pursued. But uh, yeah, some of the things that are on my back burner or not back burner, but things that I might do challenges for that I haven't, uh, haven't done yet. Um, I've been interested in doing uh, some something for chess. I've been interested in doing something for painting. I had this idea of maybe trying to start some kind of small business and document it, but uh, the details haven't come together quite right on that one yet. So I don't know. There's a lot of ideas floating about. And, and I'm not always just doing challenges, too. The challenges tend to be something for my blog, but I'm always learning things. So I'm always spending time learning Chinese and cognitive science and all other sorts of subjects. That's beautiful. How do you how do you design uh, your schedule, your curriculum for learning? Like what what part does it does it take for you? 
So again, it depends on why I'm doing it. So the ones that I do as these big public challenges, they tend to be like big, dramatic kind of full-time efforts because, you know, I'm also trying to um, showcase something that I think will be interesting. So I, I, I don't want to, you know, set too many constraints on myself. Like, well, I'm only going to work 20 minutes a day and I'm only going to do this and that. Like I try to, what would be possible if you really went all in on something? So those ones tend to be a little different because I'm spending – a lot of time working on it and often the big challenge of those is just managing the logistics of fitting it into your life like uh how do you you know get your work down to you know half a day a week how do you get all those other things in your life to kind of give you that space so that was definitely um, a challenge for those big full-time projects that i've done uh, for my regular life in learning I i'm you know a lot more about how can i inject more into my life how do i just do more in on a daily basis of doing things. So sometimes that's in coming up with little projects and other times that's, you know, just having a daily habit to put, you know, 10, 20 minutes towards this every day. And uh, so that also works. So those are kind of two dramatically different approaches to things, but on the micro level of like what I'm doing when I try to learn those, the principles tend to be the same. So I, I don't worry about it too much when I'm giving advice to people. That's cool. Um, one, one thing I'm really struggling at the moment right now is uh, <laughs> finishing my course, finishing my first book. Do you have any advice now that you have uh, written a bunch of books and created a bunch of courses on, on how to speed up the process? Okay, speed up the process. Well, I'm currently uh, in <laughs> the final stretch of publishing a new book. Uh, it's going to be coming out in August. And that book uh, has been just a really long process. It's, uh, I think I started working on it maybe three and a half years ago. Uh, just not the writing part, but the kind of conception of the idea and then pitching it to um, publishers and getting through the proposal. And then once we've got the book deal, then writing the book, and now we're in the editing phases. So I don't know whether I'm the best person to talk to about doing that fast. Um, I do think that... Uh, a lot of a lot of it is you just have to set aside time to do the work. I think um, I don't know what it is, but there's a psychological barrier that I've talked to other people that they want to do long form content, but they just don't. They haven't done it in the past. They haven't done that like a big book before. They haven't done a course or this kind of thing. And so there's a lot of like stalling and like, oh, OK, I, I know I need to work on that. I know I need to work on that. And uh, for me, just what's helped is you, you just set yourself the outline, you set yourself the deadline. Um, for courses, I find it a little easier because we do studio filming now. And so I know the studio dates. So we book the studio and we get all the equipment stuff. And so I know when I have to go in there to record, so I better be ready by then. So that makes it a little easier than if I'm just, you know, recording it bit by bit at home. Uh, but even the book too, like I had, I had deadlines from publisher deadlines from uh you know when we want to get things out when we want things to happen so those do move things along forward and i think you just got to be disciplined about doing it yourself but more than that i think there's sort of a psychological obstacle to doing this sometimes that often it can be kind of daunting to do something big uh, i mean when you're writing a, a blog post or you know you're doing a podcast interview or something it's it doesn't have the same organizational difficulties. You don't have to really get your thoughts coherent in the same way, which is also why I think books and courses are so great because you, the person who's made them has really spent a lot of time thinking about that subject. Whereas you don't necessarily need to have that same broad coherency when you're doing a blog post. But uh, yeah, at the same time that can be really difficult if you're not used to it. Beautiful. It, it warms my heart that you are also sometimes struggling with the same, same things. Like <laughs> oh, I struggle with lots of things. Lots of things. <laughs> so definitely, I think if someone could see me in real life and see my blog, they'd recognize that a lot of what I write is more on the aspirational end than this is, this is exactly who I am. It's usually stuff that, you know, I find this helps me and it helps with the problems that I face, but it's not, certainly not because I'm, you know, sitting from some higher plane of existence giving advice to people who, who uh, struggle and I, I'm totally successful with everything beautiful what is one thing that people would really surprise them about knowing something about you oh geez surprise them about or something that people about. think you are but but uh the reality is totally different an example for me is like i studied uh habit formation under uh, bj Fogg, and 
I don't know, just sometimes my room is total, totally messy and my, my roommates uh, roast me the entire time with it that I teach people about habit formation and sometimes I fail with the simplest things. Is there any big misconception about you or any, anything? Uh, I don't know about misconception. I always try to paint myself the way that I think that I am. And I mean, maybe an outside person, they are going to get some impression of me and then that's going to be wrong and they're going to be like, oh, you're actually like this. But it's never a conscious effort. It's never me trying to, you know, present myself in a way that I don't think I actually am. But, um, yeah, some of the things that I think might be like in Congress. Well, one thing is, is I'm, I'm a big napper. I really like naps. I'm actually in the process of writing an article about justifying why I think naps are <laughs> a really great productivity tool. But I mean, it, it's it's one of the like key signs of laziness is that you nap a lot. And so I often get that kind of like, oh, it's got napping in the afternoon. But uh, I really prefer, like I'm, I'm a kind of, I work in sort of these bursts of intensive frenzy where I'll write, you know, four or 5,000 words in one go and then, you know, and then I take a nap in the afternoon, but uh, just, just, you know, short things like that. So that might be one thing. Um, I definitely also, I've been much more focused on getting work done than being really neat and tidy. I tend to think of those as sort of separate things. So kind of what you're saying is that sometimes people view the productive person as being the kind of really hyper organized neat person and I don't think there's as much correlation as people think there is <laughs> that being super neat and being super productive are not actually as related as people imagine they are like obviously you need to be organized with your work to get stuff done but uh you know whether your whether your bed's made every morning is not necessarily the key to getting a lot of work done but at the same time I think that's also something that maybe people would find incongruous I mean it's not something that I've said okay you need to do this to be neat and then I'm you know not following my own advice but just from what people's perception is or maybe idea of what a productive person is maybe I differ from that dimension because I'm not always the most neat person either <laughs> if you um creating a course for example are you at the same time also writing your book because one, one thing that I'm not sure about is how I should batch my week because I tend to yeah create create very uh, weeks that are not fun at all for me because I'm not good at eliminating a lot a lot of stuff how do you organize your week when you have projects like your challenges a new book a new blog article a new uh, a new online course that you're producing do you have like do you keep yourself from writing blog posts for example when you're writing a book or when you're creating a course so i, I think i have two responses to this question because I, I used sort of one approach when I was starting out and I'm using a different approach now and I think it's for different reasons. So uh, if you, I'm assuming right now, I, I don't really know as much um, about your blog to say for sure, but I'm assuming you're doing this mostly on your own, like you don't have a big staff of people that you're working with right now. Nope, no staff, yeah. just me. <laughs> no, okay, so perfect. So I was like that for probably the better part of a decade. And so when I was in that situation, I tended to focus on one project obsessively to completion, kind of at the exclusion of most other things. I tend to put blog writing separately from that. Blog writing was a kind of weekly or, you know, habit that I had some sort of output schedule and I always did the blog. Now, even when I was doing like MIT Challenge or the Year Without English, which were really intensive projects, sometimes I'd miss weeks on the blogging. So if you look back at my archive, you'll see that I'm not even posting once a week during those challenges all the time. But uh, that aside, I wasn't doing books at the same time. I wasn't doing other things at the same time. I think there's a lot of overhead in executing projects. And I really tend to prefer what I call single projecting, where you just – You know, it's kind of like, you know, multitasking and single tasking. There's also multi-projecting and single projecting. And I prefer the single projecting where you just have one big obsessive project that you focus most of your resource towards. Now, in practice, this is a hard thing to give advice about because it's more of a general sense than an actual rule of this is one project and you're not allowed to have more than this and this. Because I've, I've talked to people and it quickly becomes untenable because, you know, well, what, it, what happens when I have a job? Is, is exercise part of the project or, you know? It's really more a mental state of you have one big thing that you're thinking about all the time rather than three or four different things. However, at this stage of my life, I now, uh, I now have a small team that I work with. And so the problem is, is that me just working on one big project leaves the other people kind of idle. Like I have people that, you know, they're really busy some of the time and then they've got nothing to do. So I do find I have to split my attention and have to manage more concurrent projects now. So one example is last year I did two big projects. So I had 
um, a book writing, which was my main principal project. And then I also created a new course uh, called Make It Happen uh, at the same time. I don't really recommend that. It was a little bit too stressful. We had some deadlines that overlapped. And I, I certainly remember it was actually before my wedding. I got married uh, last year in May. And I was I had a deadline for uh, writing the book. I had a bunch of filming due. And then I was getting married like two or three weeks after. Oh. And it was just everything kind of oh. came all at once. And I, I remember being pretty stressed out about that at the time. Um, so I don't recommend that. So I would say if you don't, if you're not in my position, you don't have to do concurrent projects. Don't do it. Um, and I'm really, I'm a lot of what I'm trying to do, even in my own team, is trying to structure things so that people can um, work on things without as much input as uh, from me, so that I can take on these big kinds of projects. Because definitely having Having a team and having people who can help you out is is, is a really great thing. Uh, for instance, you know, if I want to make something and it has a beautiful design, I have a guy who can do that now, whereas I used to, you know, to cobble something ugly together myself. But on the downside is that you now have to kind of coordinate actions between different people. And so it's a little harder to do just the obsessive one project focus. But if you are in a position in your life where you can do it, I highly recommend doing that. I agree. I, I skipped that one one thing approach because... My one thing was writing a book and I didn't know anything about writing a book <laughs> and it took me, it took me for forever and I'm finally in the last phase of my script. So I'm really uh, thinking about the day where I don't have to write this book. Are anymore. you, uh, are you self-publishing? Are you going through a traditional publisher? No, I'm self-publishing. So, it, which is pretty hard for me because if I don't hold myself accountable to a deadline, actually nothing happens. And this is a, uh, been been tricky for me so i'm a little bit more process orienting of trying to uh stick to my schedule right now i don't know maybe it's just me i i like because i've written four self-published ebooks and now i'm wor uh, working on a book with a traditional publisher and i i really like the like the legitimacy and and the you know stringency of the process of traditional publishing but Oh wow, it's way more involved than writing the self publish because I used to just write it and then I would publish it and it was done. Whereas this, there's like back and forth with agents and editors and everything has to go through a bunch of people and there's lots of processes. So I'm really looking forward to this book uh, when when I've all said and done. But having been through both processes, I think just from a sheer getting words out there, the self publishing process is a lot more efficient. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, one more question. Um, you seem to have kind of found your passion and when you, when you have a vlog, like you have one and you, you have a wife and you seem to have created a system around you that you choose. Do you remember a time in your life where this wasn't the case? Are there any particular setbacks that have led to something positive in your life? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I, I feel very blessed right now. I have a blog that is also, you know, a reasonably successful company and I'm, you know, writing a book and I, as I said, I have a wife, I'm, I have, have a nice life and I, I feel really grateful for that. I do feel like it is the product of a lot of work over, as I said, like I've been writing for 13 years. So it's definitely something that didn't happen overnight. And I got the idea of wanting to do just generally online business, not specifically being a blogger and a writer, but I just generally liked the idea of running an online business. I I've, I got interested in that idea when I was uh, 15, and it was just because I had found some guy who was making video games online, and he was just able to do the whole thing himself, sell the games, and it, just that autonomy really appealed to me. I really liked the idea of just you could just do something on your own and that, you know, whether you succeeded or failed was entirely up to you. I just really, that really appealed to me um, as a model for things. I like that a lot more than the kind of more standard approach where, yeah, people value you if you do good work, but you kind of have to get approval from other people and, you know, your boss has to like you and your coworkers have to want to work with you and stuff. I just really liked the kind of the sort of almost sheer objectivity of, of working on your, your own and whether you succeed or fail is kind of not, nobody else's business, right? And so I really liked that and I started with it. But from that moment that I first heard about the idea till where it was even at a level where I could, you know, live off of it full time was about seven years. So seven years is a long time to work towards something, a long time to work towards a goal um, without having necessarily, you know, that positive feedback or that tangible results. And I mean, there was intermediate stuff. There was, you know, you get a little blip of success here, you get a little closer, you get a little closer. So I don't want to say it was just, 
it was it was bleak. But at the same time, you know, I think for a lot of people, you know, they wouldn't have gone seven months, they never mind seven years. So I think that kind of persistency in the face of a goal, particularly a goal that is unusual and that there's no real right you have to believe that you can do it. And I, I think that's something that has been a very defining quality for me. So I don't know whether I would see life the same way if I had just been spontaneously successful at that goal. Like if the first thing I had done, it just really worked and I had been successful at it. And I think the other thing too, is that even though it took a while for that success to manifest, I was really building a lot of skills in that time and I was getting better at a lot of things so that you know, often I find when you have those kind of very quick successes, you're not actually ready for them because you haven't mastered the underlying parts that you need to have mastered to get to that point. And so when, you know, yeah, you can kind of master them later, but sometimes what happens is you achieve success too early um, and you're not able to sustain it or you're not able to bring it into something cohesive because you just don't have the experience to back it up. So for me, I felt that those seven years really taught me a lot and, and the, you know, what would it be the six years following it have taught me even more so i think that that has made a big difference um but i definitely feel yeah it's uh it's a big part of going through this process is having that or sorry not seven years it would be more than that now actually it would be seven years and then that would be yeah an additional eight years after that that i've been uh, writing since that sort of inflection point but i think yeah, definitely the the struggling phase can be something that's hard when you're in it, but I think it also it builds a lot of things that make the eventual success more stable and, and have a stronger foundation. That was a beautiful answer. Knowing what you know now, what was the what would you do what would you do different if you could give your younger self some advice when you were just starting out your blog in order to maybe reach this this critical point of of where you could live off your block or do you think it's a patience thing that you just have to put in the years you know i people ask that a lot because they're like oh what would you give some advice but the problem is and it goes kind of what i was saying is that I, like seven years ago or sort of seven years like that during that seven year period i wasn't really ready to do things the way I'm doing now. So there's a certain sense that it's even though we're talking about it, like it's not a credentialed field. It's a little bit like if you're a doctor and someone just happened to give you a medical diploma, like your first year of med school, you're not ready. You know what I mean? Like you actually haven't built the knowledge and skills to be a good doctor. And so I think taking it from that perspective, there's nothing really I could tell myself that it, that would have compensated for the lessons that I had to learn directly. I think, um, If I just going back and thinking about it now, obviously with the skills that I've acquired, I don't think it would take me so long if I had to start from scratch all over again. But at the same time, I feel like everything I did was a really valuable lesson uh, going forward with that. If I were to, to think about it differently now about what I would focus on, I think one of the mistakes that I perhaps made early on was focusing a little bit too much on kind of trying to manifest a kind of positive feedback signal. Because there was an anxiety about, well, am I even, like, is this going to work even at all? And so I was sort of interested in, like, trying to make money a little earlier than maybe I should have or trying to get that, okay, this I need to validate this. I need to prove that this idea is correct. Um, whereas I probably should have spent a little bit more time just focusing on, you know, improving the quality of the stuff that I'm doing, like getting, being a better writer, being more experienced, um, making something that's really original and, and worth worth sharing and worth talking about and so i think that uh if i were to say that that is maybe a tendency that it like there's a bit of an anxiety of when you're starting out of oh am i going to be successful at all so you kind of seek that uh, validation uh, perhaps a little prematurely so i do know people who get into this kind of business and you know they've got 100 200 subscribers and they're like well i've got to get a course out or i got to get an ebook out or i got to get that kind of thing out And I almost want to tell them, you know, just wait, just wait, like get the 5,000 people, get the 10,000 people, because that's kind of the main goal, right? Uh, and so you don't need to get that validation as early. But when I go back and I think about it, just the psychology of it is so powerful. I'm not sure whether even if I gave myself that advice, whether I would stop myself from doing <laughs> oh, it. That is beautiful. Um, I want to talk with you a bit about habits. And one thing that I'm really fascinated about is the combination of learning how to learn and habit formation because 
just from my personal experience, I started to focus on those two areas because very early in my life I was I was struggling a lot with depression and but I was also a psychology student and my thinking was that while learning how to be happy and combining this with habit formation and actually seeing how your brain does take information in, your life changes pretty pretty fast and it is one of the most under teach things there is I think and I wanted to ask you now that you have created this, this, this system of learning in your life and wrote a few few uh, books. Well, how has your habits changed so much? Okay, yeah. So uh, the interesting thing about this when we're talking about learning and habits is that in a very, I think, kind of a more sort of cognitive science perspective, I don't think that there is a fundamental distinction between learning and habits, which sounds kind of crazy because when, well, like habits is like going to the gym regularly and learning is like studying for chemistry. But at, I think, a, at a brain level, they're kind of the same thing. And what I mean by that is that what, what you're doing when you're talking about a habit, and I mean uh, a habit in the sense of a sort of kind of a semi-automatic behavioral response uh, to a certain set of triggers. So you, you set your life up in such a way that you get cued by your environment to do the sort of things that you want to do in your life. And learning in a certain sense is also the same kind of thing, that you have a certain set of contextual cues. Uh, it could be the question on a test or it could even just be you know doing something in life where you can apply some knowledge and you need to activate a certain set of behavioral responses. Some of those are mental. It's sort of a mental process of thinking through a problem and then coming to a solution. So... I really think of it in terms of uh, that they're actually kind of the same thing in some way, that you have some kind of broad environment, some sort of sensory input uh, from the environment that could be, you know, the room you're in, what you're thinking about, the things that are around you, what time of day it is, you know, all these sorts of cues. And you are trying to create a response to that you want your default response to that to be something that's broadly positive so when your alarm comes off it's like the classic example when your alarm goes off maybe you want to like immediately turn the alarm off and go jogging in the morning but your default response is to hit the snooze button and sleep for another half hour or you want when you know you have some free time to read that book that you think is really important and not to just like twiddle it away on facebook or reddit or you want to um, do that kind of thing. So, and learning is, is very similar is that learning is also a process of given some set of cues, you want to access the right knowledge in the right time and the right procedure for doing things. So I, I find that like it, at a, at a sort of real deep level, I see them as being kind of the same thing. So interesting. Um, what is it like to be you right now from a behavior standpoint? How does your day look? How does your day look like? <laughs> You know what? So that's another good point too, because we're talking about habits, and um, I, I've I've talked about this idea before on my blog of what's called meta meta stability. So meta stability is a concept that comes from uh, physics or engineering, and so you, the classic way of thinking of it is uh, if you think of a pendulum, the pendulum at the bottom is stable, meaning that it will stay there even if you move it a little bit, it will stay there. Whereas the pendulum, if you turn it just completely on the upside down, so it's pointed exactly straight up, well, in a physical sense, it it's actually um, it's actually stable, meaning that if there's no nothing to move it to the left or right, it won't fall in either direction. But of course, we know from real life that if you try to put a pendulum in that situation, it'll immediately fall in one direction. So the reason is because it's metastable, which means that even the slightest you know, even an atom's difference of one side or the other quickly causes it to to fall down. And so this metastability is this idea that you can have something in a kind of stable state, but if there's noise or perturbations from the outside, it can destroy that. And so for habits, I tend to think of most of the habits that we actually really want to build, exercise, waking up early, uh, meditating, all these things are probably more metastable than stable, meaning that we can sustain them in a relatively low effort fashion, but life is always changing. There's always noise from the environment. So I think the right way to view habits is that there's always a process of construction and repair. So even if you get to a point where you're doing it really well, you don't reach this perfected state where your life is perfectly in stasis and you always have these excellent habits and they never break. Usually what's happening is 
you get it to a point where it doesn't require very much effort, but something will knock you off, so you have to readjust and you have to readjust. And so for me, I find my life uh, is particularly, it's always in flux, always changing. I'm doing different projects. I'm doing, you know, these challenges. I had different habits for each of these challenges. I had different habits for each of these things. And so for me, what I try to do is I try to focus on habits in this kind of medium term that kind of what do I want my habits to be for my life right now? What kind of routine do I want to set up? And I want to get in the habit of creating new habits and building those things. So I'm always kind of in flux. So these days, uh, some of my core habits are I've been doing um, like a few habits on this kind of don't don't break the chain philosophy where you do it every single day and it's kind of minimal. Uh, I've written about that also in my blog about kind of minimal habits versus average or, or other types of habits. So I've been doing uh, like 50 push-ups a day. I've been doing 10 minutes of practicing Chinese uh, every day. I've been meditating every day. I've been doing, you know, have some ho- like household ones like cleaning and, and flossing and that kind of stuff for, for daily habits. So those are some of my daily habits that I'm trying to do all the time. Um, you know, other things like that, uh, working and productivity and those kind of things, they're, they're also big parts of my, my daily behavior routine. One thing I, I need to ask you is because I, I'm, I'm learning uh, also languages and I think um, I'm so hungry for when I finish this book on habit formation, I want to learn, write about uh, habits that will lead to learning a language faster. Because in Germany, there's this, this big problem that everybody is learning French or Spanish in, in school and 10 years later, nobody nobody speaks any words anymore because nobody learns how to form the habits of, of learning um, that language. And I wanted to ask you, how is Scott Young learning a language? How those, do those 10, 10 minutes look like when you do it? Well, okay, so I think you're bringing up a really good point. I want to distinguish two things because you talked about a specific example of people in Germany learning a language in school and then not speaking it after. Some of that is a kind of inferior, insufficient learning process. I mean, people in Germany learn to speak English quite well, uh, but maybe not as well for some of the other languages. And I think that's just is driven out of use and necessity. You know, we're having this conversation in English right now. So that's something that, you know, drives that English ability. And so I think for um, a lot of people, they learn it as an academic exercise and it never really integrates with their life and never, ever really you know, they learned it in school and they learned it for tests, but they never actually went to the country and spoke it with people and did that kind of thing. So we could talk a lot about the learning process of learning new languages, but I think an important thing, which is something that maybe is underrated and doesn't get talked about enough, is maintenance. And um, I've learned this from having done this project that I think uh, this was even something that I underrated, that before I did it, I was like, oh, you know, well, like the learning the language is the hard part. The maintaining it is relatively easy. And now I've come to the belief that maintaining your ability to speak a language at a conversational level or a fluent level, um, th that that is actually a big part of the challenge, um, that you will have your language abilities degrade over time that you will forget vocabulary, that things will become less automatic. Now, there are some ways around that. You can, uh, obviously, by practicing in kind of an immersion environment, you you benefit from what is known as overlearning, which means that like core phrases and words you just say so many times that they're very hard to forget. But even then, I think that there's, you know, if you, if you learn a language and then you don't use it for three years, you're going to be pretty, pretty rusty. And so I think a big problem that I've seen is that people learn a language and they just don't pay attention to maintenance. They don't pay attention to what do I need to do to make this language sort of at the tip of my tongue, so to speak. And so um, one of the things that I've done is I've learned now uh, a few languages is uh, I have regular um, Skype sessions online with people to practice it and maintain it. So I do that as a regular thing. Now, it's not a, really a goal to improve the language. <laughs> so I, I have, a, for instance, I have like a Korean lesson maybe once a month or so, once every two months. And 
you know, my, my tutor is always kind of like, Scott, why are you not like practicing where you're, you're not getting better. But for me, I'm not really trying to get better. I'm just trying to hold what I have. And you kind of need that input to hold what you have. So I think that's a big thing is that people go, let's say they go on a trip and they learn Spanish. They went to South America and they learned some Spanish and then they come home and they don't practice it for six years. And they're like, Oh, I forgot all my Spanish. How did that happen? Well, it's because you kind of need to do some maintenance and whether you want to do that maintenance is a personal choice. I know some people that there's, you know, what, I can't be bothered. Like, I enjoyed learning it, but I can't be bothered to maintain it. But at the same time, you're going to have to anticipate then that if that you're not going to be as crisp and as fluent as you'd like if you, let's say, bump into a Spanish speaker on the street, it's going to be a little awkward. So, I mean, you can relearn it. Relearning is another option to maintaining it where you just – you can just, okay, I'm going to go back to Spain for three weeks and, and practice that Spanish again. And that does work, and it does come back a lot faster than learning it the first time. So that's not a bad option, and I do choose to do that for a lot of subjects. Like the MIT challenge, I choose to do that for computer science topics just because, you know, I don't want to be uh, keeping the ability to solve math problems on the tip of my pencil, so to speak, uh, at all times. It's just not worth it for me. But I do think for languages because – you often encounter these situations where you think to yourself, oh, I can speak language X. And then you encounter a situation, you start speaking, you're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't speak anything right now. That if you want to be able to maintain that, you have to put in some regular practice. Now, the 10 minute day of Chinese is a little different because for Chinese, I am actually actively trying to improve it. So the 10 minutes a day is just kind of a lower threshold of making sure that reading and listening in Chinese is just sort of a regular part of my life. And I am actually trying to improve that, but that's a lot more work than maintaining it. But I think, again, when I talk to most people, as soon as they're not in an environment where they're using it, they don't do any practice. And then they're kind of disappointed when, you know, let's go like a couple years, five years, 10 years down the road, they, they've lost a lot of it. What's your opinion on Duolingo? I think Duolingo, Duolingo is a fascinating app, but I'm, but I'm always not, not sure if they are teaching VR um, passive recall or active recall. Is I, I don't like Duolingo. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> I'll explain why. This is the thing, and I feel bad for the app makers. Uh, so if any of the people who work for Duolingo are listening, I'm sorry. I think that you're doing what you think you need to do. Uh, it's just not what I would do. And so I think the problem is that a lot of people who make apps, and I experienced this myself making courses, is that there's often a trade-off between what people would need to do to learn it successfully and what people want to do or they're willing to do. And sometimes there's a trade-off there. And I feel a lot of people who get Duolingo to learn languages are fundamentally unserious about learning the language. They don't actually want to put in any effort. And so, you know, is Duolingo better than nothing? Yeah, probably. So if that's the market that you're looking at, if you're just sort of like, well, I'm not going to do any other practice, like I wasn't actually going to take a lesson or I wasn't actually going to, you know, do some study or do something that was kind of hard. If that is your sort of benchmark that you weren't going to do any of those and this was just something to like kill some time. Yeah, it's probably better than playing like Clash of Clans or, you know, some kind of app phone game. But in the same sense, I don't like Duolingo because in my opinion, the cognitive activity that they're teaching in, du in Duolingo is also... Uh, not related to actually speaking the language at, in a real material way. So I'll give an example. The classic way of doing a Duolingo thing, because I, I tried it with Italian. I was like, you know what, I'm going to try it out with a new language uh, when I went on a trip to Italy. And I'm doing it for a little while, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this, this won't work. It will maybe help with reading, but it's not going to help with speaking. And the reason why is because you get a thing where it'll say, okay, you want to translate this sentence. So give a sentence like, you know, the boy picked the apples or the boy ate the apple or something like that. And giving that sentence and giving a translation task isn't, isn't a terrible way to learn, learn a language. Often what you're trying to do when you're speaking a language in the beginning is some kind of sort of translation exercise where you immediately get the idea in English and you're trying to force out what would that be in the other language. So there's nothing really wrong with that. The problem is that the way the Duolingo works is they give you a word bank with about 10 words in the bottom and you have to just pick them. Well, picking words out of 10, a word box of 10 is not at all like speaking a language. When you're speaking an actual sentence, first of all, you have no cues. So you have no idea what words you actually have to insert to make a correct sentence. Second, 
you may not actually have the correct word in your long-term memory. So it may even be the case that the word you're trying to say, you just don't actually have it stored in memory. So you have to work around it. That's a big part of speaking language in the beginning is I want to say X. I don't have a word for X. What's a way around that so I can communicate the same idea? That's a huge part of learning it. And you have to do it in real time. And you actually have to move your lips and mouth in order to make the speaking. Now, Duolingo, I think, Part of the reason that they do it this way is one, the issue I just already mentioned that doing this is much more difficult than what they actually do in the app. So a lot of people would be, find it frustrating and find it effortful and they would just give up. And then the second reason is because I think the way the app works, it's all procedurally generated content that sometimes in the app, for instance, it gives you a prompt where you type it with the keyboard. So you type your answer with the keyboard and it's way too sensitive to the exact form that they want you to answer the question. So you might write it and you forget an accent on the E or something and it grades it as wrong. And that's very frustrating as the learner because you're like, well, I was almost right. Why is it grading you wrong? And I, I don't, don't like that because very often there's a lot of different ways to express the right idea. And you can say to yourself, oh, I was, pretty close to the right thing. And that's better than nothing. But the way with the procedural uh, grading that they have, I think it's very hard to get that kind of, you know, you said in essence, the right thing, even though you didn't write it exactly the way they had formatted it. So that's another reason I think they pick this word bank strategy. Uh, and you can get this kind of active recall this, uh, this really direct practice, but you have to really dig into the lessons. So you have to do like, you know, keep studying the same lesson, like to a really high difficulty. And only then do they start giving you those kind of lessons. So for me, I feel like the app designers were kind of aware that you, this is how you need to learn a language, but they buried it because it's probably frustrating and, and people didn't like it. Um, I would recommend Pimsleur over Duolingo as a, as a beginner resource, just because Pimsleur, um, even though it's a really older technology, Pimsleur does have the full recall, which is closer to what you need. I don't think any of them are going to be perfect. I think the thing that you want to do is start having conversations with people. You want to start actually being in a communication environment and working your way through things. But a lot of people find that too difficult uh, in the beginning. So I would say there's nothing wrong with doing some preliminary practice to give yourself some more confidence. Um, if you just really find speaking with someone like, oh, I have no idea how I'd possibly do that. So, but at the same time, I'm I feel like Duolingo is probably, if you spend a whole bunch of time on Duolingo, you may learn to read. Uh, you may learn to hear a little bit, but uh, speaking is going to be a real struggle. There's going to be a lot of transfer problems for that, uh, for the amount of time you spend doing it. Oh, that was amazing. I I was uh, right about to say preach, preach, because I'm one of the only guys in my, my circle who who is, is not a fan of Duolingo because I feel they are ignoring a few fundamental basis of how you actually learn, how your brain does take information in. And at a certain point it frustrates you because for example, my, my girlfriend is right now, she's not in Germany and she tried to speak Spanish and she's, she finished Duolingo and uh, <laughs> she's, she's struggling. She can speak like three languages, uh, three, three sentences. And I feel that they should emphasize even more that you, they somehow implement that you talk to real humans and they have the technology to do it. But then it becomes, uh, then it's not so addictive anymore, I think. And then less people would actually do it. Yeah, I think that's a fundamental problem of learning. And this is one of the things that I've really tried to talk about in my own work and in, in, in this upcoming book I'm writing is, is all about this subject. But it is basically that learning is a fundamentally effortful activity and there is a certain inescapability of that, that if you really want to learn something well, you need to you need to be expending a certain amount of effort. Now, not all effort is created equal. So just making something harder for the sake of making it harder is not necessarily more efficient. However, um, a lot of the a lot of the things that make learning efficient when it is efficient are hard. They're effortful to do. And so I think For me, I'd much rather learn a language with the idea of, okay, I'm going to learn this language. I'm going to really like just push through that frustration in the beginning and get to a part where I'm having conversations with people and 
participating in meaningful dialogue. I'd much rather do that than spend a hundred hours on Duolingo and have, you know, your, uh, your partner's experience there where she was saying, you know, okay, I've finished the Duolingo Spanish, but I like struggling to get sentences out. It doesn't mean that there's zero benefit of doing Duolingo. So again, it depends on what your alternative is. I'm comparing it with this kind of, um, harder approach. I've been calling it ultra learning, this sort of intense self-directed education. Uh, and I, I, if that's the comparison, I much prefer the approach that I'm advocating. But if you're comparing it to doing nothing, like if it was just something to do on your phone, I mean, maybe there's some better apps out there. I, I tend to prefer Anki, but uh, Anki is also a little bit less fun and more frustrating than Duolingo. So, I mean, you know, you have to kind of decide yourself. Duolingo is popular because people really like doing it. And so I think you know, and, and this kind of is going back to another point. Do you really want to learn a language? I think a lot of people want to feel like they're doing something uh, productive. They want to feel like they want to have that kind of sense of, oh, I'm doing something kind of important, but they don't really care so much to speak it. So I think it really depends on evaluating your goals. If your goal is just, well, I want to kill some time and this is better than playing a game, then, oh, I totally agree with you. I think doing Duolingo is going to be better than that. However, if it's the question of, okay, I'm preparing for a big trip or I really want to be able to speak this language for purpose X, Y, Z, and, uh, you know, what's the most efficient use of my time to get there, I would not recommend Duolingo. But again, you, you got to kind of decide for yourself. So I don't really hate on anyone who's using Duolingo just because I know from talking to people that when I tell them what I think they should do instead, they're not interested. So <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Couldn't agree more. Uh, let's rush to the last questions so I can be respective of your time. Uh, Scott, what would constitute a perfect day for you? perfect day oh wow that is a that's a that's a difficult question um you know what i would say that my my best days and i don't really have control of them always but my best days are usually when i do some work something difficult that i am able to accomplish something that i'm really proud of at the end of the day so you know when i was writing my book those were days where i'd write a chapter and i felt like it really worked like i really got it or, you know, when I was doing the MIT challenge and I, I, you know, did some studying and I felt like I really understood something and learned something new. And so for me, I, I tend to associate a really good day not with relaxation, but with something vigorous and something challenging and, you know, growing myself and stretching myself and, and reaching that accomplishment. Now, the problem is that you're not always going to have days like that. So if you set that as your goal, sometimes you're going to have days where you fall short of it and you're going to be, I wasn't as productive as I would have liked to have been. And so I think in those days too, you have to kind of accept to a certain extent that, you know, you can always strive to be better, but you can't also beat yourself up because you don't reach that uh, I ideal of perfection every single day. Um, really, it's just some days you're going to have days where you have creative breakthroughs and you're really productive and you get stuff done and it feels amazing. And then there's other days where, you know, you're going to wake up, you're exhausted, you slog it through, you you know, I, I've done that before where, you know, I write two or three drafts and they all end up in the, the you know, the recycling bin on my desktop and I, I don't, you know, don't go anywhere with them. And those always feel a little bit of a bummer. But I think, you know, you, you kind of have to have those days as well to have the good days. I can relate so much. I started writing my book after like my fifth blog post. And after spending half a year on it, I realized that the entire first six six chapters were just garbage <laughs> it was one of the most frustrating experiences of that year um yeah if you could add one ingredients for the recipe for happiness uh what would you say Ooh. <laughs> you're hitting me with all these difficult questions right near the end one thing for happiness um You know what, this is a little bit, this is kind of a, a deeper philosophical aside, so I don't know whether I can fully explain myself in the time available, but I really feel like the the kind of the essence of happiness is being in the moment and being um, kind of accepting of what the moment is, and I think that that's very hard for us to do, and it's very hard to make that compatible with all the other stuff that we've talked about, where you're striving and reaching, although people who are not striving and reaching are always kind of finding things to nitpick and, and dislike about the current moment. But even in your best moments, very often you're, you're kind of, there's a, there's a sort of subtle anxiety because you want to hold on to it and keep it and, you know, make it perpetual and, or make that the thing that happens all the time. And I think that it's, it's rare, but if you can be in those states where 
you're not trying to change things and you're allowing things to be as they are, even when you're in motion, even when you're in activity. So, you know, you're writing an article and it's not going so well, but you're okay with that because that's what you're doing. I think the, the times in your life where you can just be accepting of where you are on the path of your life and you're doing what you need to do, but you don't, you're not trying to rush it. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to hold on to it. You're not trying to keep disaster from happening. Um, I think those are really important moments. And so I always try to see how I can cultivate more of that in my own life. Although, you know, I certainly fall short of the ideal. Beautiful. Um, let's go to the last, uh, chapter of this interview. I'm just going to give you a few questions and just, Uh, say what's on your mind. They are really short questions. <laughs> then you are then you are through. <laughs> um, okay. What noise do you love? I love the sound of birds chirping. Beautiful. What noise do you hate? Uh, what noise do I hate? Uh, you know when you cut cutlery on like a porcelain plate and it makes that screeching sound. <laughs> My okay. worst. Okay. It's my least what's a question you wish people would ask themselves more often? I think just why, uh, I think that people are fundamentally incurious and they don't ask why for everything. And I think that's something that kind of consumes me. And I think that that's something people would benefit from asking themselves more often. Last question, then you are through. If you could put a life slogan on every coffee cup in the world, what slogan would that be? No, I can't think of it. You know what? The truth is, is that there's a lot of, lot of like short little cliches that have some wisdom in it. But I think the problem is that you hear something too much and it, it no longer has that resonance. So as soon as you put it on a coffee cup, it would be banal and, and, and it wouldn't inspire anyone. So it's the slogan that you've never heard before. That's the one that's going to really impact you. It's not going to be the one that's on the coffee cup. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Scott, I'm so, I'm so grateful for your time. I took much more than I expected to take, but there's like a million more questions that I could ask you. And yeah, I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk to me and this really meant a lot to me. So thank you for the interview. Thank you. Well, folks, this was today's episode. I hope this could add some value to you guys. This podcast still is in this experimental phase, so please let me know what you liked and didn't like. You can let me know on my blog, danielkareem.com, or on social media. As always, thank you so much for listening, and tune in next time.